when I was eight or nine, you know, um, it kind of hit me and I kind of realized, you know, that uh, the hand that I had been served um, uh, by just virtue of the geography I was born meant that I only had one shot and one ticket out of poverty um, and out of um, the village. Um, and that ticket was doing well in um, um, the exams, because we have exams at eighth grade. To be able to get into the boarding school I went to, um, the only way I could do that is if I would be ranked the first kid um, on the eighth grade exam in my county, so that I could represent the, the I could take the county's slot. Um, so it's kind of like the NBA draft, but um, now the talent is just how you're gonna do on a three-day exam. As I approached eighth grade, um, and as I approached this exam, it became at a really young age a do or die moment, right? Because if I couldn't be able to go to this um, publicly funded government uh, secondary school, um, my parents couldn't afford to um, take me to any other form of secondary school. Um, and if I can't go to secondary school, you know, the kind of dreams that I can dream, the kind of life I can live, you know, um, the kind of just different, you know, it's a different vibe, you know. Um, and um, I am, I do consider myself to have been lucky. Um, and I actually, and if you ask my parents, you know, people ask them, um, do you think like Tom going to Harvard is like the best thing that has ever happened to you, to, to him or to your guy? And they always say, you know, it's Tom getting into high school, right? Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are at the Elliott House at Harvard in beautiful Cambridge, Massachusetts. We are now gonna be talking about actualizing Africa's potential. We have Tom Osborne, AKA Okumu, joining yeah. us on the show. Thank you so much for having me, I'm pretty excited. I'm super excited, thank you, thank you for coming on and huge shout out to Julia Shea yeah. for <laughs> hooking, hooking us together to do this. So for those that don't know Tom's background, so Tom is actually his Christian name, Okumu is his tribal name. So Okumu, Tom Osborne, is a psychology and computer science student at Harvard University focused on life outcomes of young people in Sub-Saharan Africa. In 2014, he co-founded Greenshar, which provides clean cooking fuel for homes, schools, and institutions in Kenya, having raised venture capital and grew the staff to 20 people and have 3,000 clients. Since then, he is principal investigator of the Shamiri Mental Health Project at the Laboratory for Youth Mental Health at Harvard University and consulting with companies doing business in Africa with organizations like Safaricom, which is Kenya's largest telecom provider. All right. Epic background, very young. It's very interesting that this move even from Kenya to Cambridge, which we're gonna talk about, and the differences in culture and kind of what's happening on a geopolitical level. Let's start things off with one of our favorite questions. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Wow, um, once again, thank you so much for having me and uh, sorry for making you go through a mouthful <laughs> with the bio. <laughs> I love um, the bio. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, but that's a really you know interesting question. You know, um, um, I am I am optimistic about the direction of the world. You know, I think uh, right now more than ever, um, especially in the communities that I come from, you know, um, we are seeing the way technology is impacting people's um, lives in terms of um, improving um, access to healthcare, in terms of improving access to quality education, in terms of increasing civic and political engagement. Um, and I think um, if we um, can um, democratize the world, what I mean by this, if we can get 70% of the world which has uh, been left behind um, um, when it comes to making decisions about the future of the world involved in the table, um, um, if we can make um, countries in South Africa, the global south, not only just have to look at the dining table from the window, but also if you can give them a seat in the dining table and make them uh, more important players um, in determining the direction of the world, um, then we can be able to um, unlock you know the potential you know um, that we have right now. You know because technology has revolutionized um, um, everything, and if we do it effectively, you know we can be um, on a path towards something great in our lifetime. Yeah. What a great analogy for looking at it, just not being at the dining table of decision-making, mm -hmm. just that 
the decisions are being made by other people for us yeah. versus being civically engaged and inspired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Which is kind of sad because, you know, uh, uh, majority of the countries in the world, majority of our societies are democratic, uh, you know, and, and um, the philosophy of democracy is that we should all be in the dining table. But, you know, uh, the way we have implemented democracy um, doesn't live to this ideal. You know, we are sniffing the aroma from the table, um, but that's as close as we are <laughs> to the actual table, right? And so we have um, a few s global centers of decision-making telling. We, so it's a good analogy is we have um, um, about 50,000 people telling 7 billion people how to live, you know, <laughs> and making the decisions for um, the, the uh, 7 billion people in the world, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is a major difference in culture in terms of just having complete freedom over direction of decision of how I want to behave for what reasons. Maybe it's not for productivity and economic gain or reason. Maybe it's more for just living, period, just being alive mm -hmm. and just engaging with people in a playful way. So this is... Although there is also some crazy benefit of being able to live l parents sick, well, some of the capitalistic healthcare infrastructure has also helped our parent or family member live 10, 20, 30 more years. So it's a very strange uh, conversational balance. It's very nuanced and difficult to figure out exactly what it is, which I, I want to, uh, let's get, let's actually dive into that a little bit more mm -hmm, in yeah. this, in this next bit. Um, okay. So. The, yeah, just nuts the way you're putting it. Just like tens of thousands of people making decisions for billions. Yes, yes. So, okay, finding yourself, Nyabera? Nyabera, yeah. Nyabera, <laughs> yeah. Nyabera in Kenya. This is in the Rongo district mm -hmm. on West Kenya near Lake Victoria. So this is where you're born. Mm -hmm. And then I want you to speak about this life in Kenya. What is this like culturally, politically, economically? Yeah, yeah, you know, so if you like, look look at the map of Kenya, you know, Nairobi, the capital is right there in the middle. And uh, if you go eight hours west towards um, 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 Lake Victoria, um, you'll come to um, Nyabera, that's how I was born. Um, and uh, I was born in a really, you know, interesting time. I was born when Kenya was, uh, as a country, you know, was... Um, going through what adults would consider a midlife crisis in its country, which was just in its 40s, um, approaching its 50s. Um, uh, but it was a country you know, where we are still you know, right now grappling with uh, basic things like what does it mean to be a Kenyan, right? And we will you know, talk about it later, but like what the f um, scramble and petition um, for Africa did is um, um, it made people citizens of countries for which none of them, uh, you know, participated in um, the decision around, uh, you know, the decision around that country being a country in the first place. And, you know, one of the things uh, when I came to the U.S., for example, um, and I'm just going to tie it to Nyabera, is people ask me, um, how do you deal, how do you live um, in such a diverse society as the U.S., you know, where there's, um, quote-unquote, all this kind of discrimination going on? Um, and I'm like, um, the only difference is not everyone, but most people um, in the U.S., you know, decided that they were going to be part of this country, you know. So in Kenya, just to give you a background, we have 42 tribes, um, 42 different cultures, 42 different traditions, some of which historically... Um, have disliked each other um, and uh, they are now forced to be um, a country to coexist to be patriotic to you know um, love the flag and all this kind of stuff and so when I was born um, um, we had perhaps one of the most um, iconic moments in our, in our history as a country where um, we in 2002 ended a 24 year old, year, year old dictatorship. So for 24 years, Kenya was under dictatorship. Uh, but what that meant also is 
the living conditions were were pretty you know um, uh, um, difficult. You know, the, the challenges that I grappled with as a young boy um, were primarily around survival. You know, just around waking up, getting food, going to school, um, coming back home, um, seeing everyone is okay. You know, thanking God at the end of the night, um, and you know, repeating every day. You know, um, my dream when I was seven years old um, was to be a pastor because you know, in my village, that was the most respected you know person was the was the church leader or the school teacher. You know, um, um, back then, thinking that I will, for example, be here um, giving this uh, podcast at at Harvard College, um, people will think. Um, I was high on <laughs> some um, some kind of drug, you know. Um, um, yeah, and um, what I do like about my upbringing is uh, I think um, I got a grounding on what I, I like to call the fundamentals, um, the fundamentals of um, um, humanity. Mm. Um, and I think these fundamentals, uh, um, one which we, we do not appreciate, uh, much is just life, just being able to enjoy um, living. You know, we don't we we take it for granted, but I think it's it's a really great gift to have um, people. You know, um, when you when you're growing up um, and you don't have um, you don't have television to keep you entertained, or you don't go on hikes over the weekend or summer camps, right? Um, you only have your peers, you only have your friends, right? And so your so people become they play a much more important role when I was growing up. They're not only like friends, but also like social spot outlets. Um, yeah, yeah. And a uh, couple things. First, crazy on twenty-four year dictator leaving around ninety-five. Um, so that was 2002. 2002 yeah. is when that, okay, okay. But yeah. I thought you said it was when you were born. Okay, a so little like, later. Yeah, yeah. Okay, mm. okay. So, so that was like the, you the were first eight. thing I remember, like one of my first like childhood memories um, around the 2000, 2002, three period where uh, we were moving on because it was such a time of optimism because we were coming from this long dictatorship. Yeah. And so then it became a time of, of more optimism mm-hmm. because it got out of a dictatorship that wasn't that healthy for the people of the country. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then there, you said there's 42 tri- tribes? Yeah, 42 tribes. 42 tribes that have historically also been interesting relationships between each other. Yeah, not, not, not all the 42 tribes, but some of the 42 tribes, you know, um, historically... You know, um, um, have relationship. So, like a really good example is, um, I went to high school um, next to Nairobi, and the high school I went to is a public boarding school. Uh, but the way the government admitted kids to the school is they admitted kids from every county. And I remember before I went to the school, um, people in my village telling me, "Be careful of kids from X tribe because they eat people, for example, or." they do X, Y, Z, or these people from this tribe can't be trusted because um, they're historically crooks or thieves or something like that, right? So we have um, all these like really interesting relations. And uh, with these interesting relations, you have to form a nation, right? Uh, yeah. But it becomes hard to do that because in my village, you speak the Lua, which they don't speak in 80% of Kenya or more, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, so it's 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 a, it's a different ball game there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, too, yeah, dude. yeah. So 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 interesting. So the boarding school itself actually had kids from all of these different tribes. Too. Yeah. So you you kind of got exposed to that in a sense. And kind of did, did you did you feel for well these are all just young kids from around Kenya like. There's just it became kind of normal to interface with the different ones and see how you're kind of just all human. Yeah, and, and I think that was the intention of the school, um, and I think the school, the system did a really good job, you know, because after two, three weeks, you know, after a few months, you know, you you realize that all these differences, because you've grown up with artificial differences that do not exist. You know, we 
um, care about the same things, we want the same, you know, dreams of in life, right? Um, and um, I think the only unfortunate thing is um, right now, not all kids in Kenya you know, are able to kind of experience this kind of environment. And that's why, for example, tribalism is still, you know, perpetuated intergenerationally. Uh, and I think this kind of school and exposing kids at a really young age to um, diverse people c really helps break the, the stereotypes and such a, at such a formative age also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, a couple quick things. One of the things is that I also, coming from a very heavily white part of South Dakota in the middle of the United States, went to Minneapolis. Minneapolis, much more liberal, cosmopolitan, melting pot, immediately became exposed to people from Latin America, people from Africa, people from Asia, yeah. people from yeah different parts That's of the well, world, yeah. Europe. And so immediately my, all of those notions of any sort of bigotry were just like, these are humans. Exactly. Right. And so <laughs> it was beautiful having that moment and then also going to San Francisco after that again, another moment, moment of more moment. cosmopolitan yeah. melting pot. So, and that's interesting that you can re even relate that to like 42 tribes in Kenya as well. So you can be view viewed that way. Okay, also you mentioned this really interesting, the fundamentals. I thought that was really cool. Where here, it can be as simple as being distracted by television or any other one of these uh, distractive mm -hmm. things that we have versus one of the fundamentals that you listed is this w wake wake up food and then you you need to figure out how to feed yourself you need to go to school you need to when you kind of you kind of uh the priest or the or the teacher is known as the two of the highest positions amongst you and then you come back home and you you are grateful that your family is still there and that everyone's healthy and and then you have to learn like you said the social the social the social, aspect, yeah. social aspects speak more about that yeah uh i think one of the what is going to be one of the greatest challenges um, um uh, of a lifetime um, um is going to be around sociability i think you know the internet and technology has done a tremendous amount of um of great things in the world, you know, we, we cannot and we should not like under, understate the, the value um, and importance of technological advances and they should be encouraged. But I think one, um, one byproduct, if I'd call it, of this rapid advancements in technology is that we have, I, I think, lost this element of sociability. You know, um, finding joy and happiness in human to human interaction just for the sake of the human to human interaction we I think is a really important part of how we've evolved um, 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 as people um, is kind of being lost because now we can go a day two days three days not even talking to anyone and we'll be you know perfectly okay but um, because of that I think we develop a lot of challenges, especially uh, mental related challenges, you know, we, people are becoming less sad in some societies. Um, um, for example, you, you see new studies coming out that 30% of people in Japan like have never been in a relationship um, and they're like over 35 years old. Um, and um, um, I think we, we risk losing the value and enjoyment um, of just consuming human to human interactions for the sake of just those interactions without the interactions having to lead per se to uh, a specific um, end. You know, um, and, and, uh, and I think if we can figure out how to make technology a little bit more social and, um, and more facilitating of these interactions, that would be great, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a lot to talk about that difference between just a uh, social interaction for the sake of just well-being in life versus um, needing to get to some sort of an economic or productive um, goal from it. That's it's such an interesting point. Now, um, but I want you to give us, you know, going fr from village to the boarding school. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. how did... How did you get even into that boarding school first? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, 
Um, when I so when I was eight or nine, you know, um, it kind of hit me, and I kind of realized, you know, that uh, the hand that I had been served um, uh, by just virtue of the geography I was born meant that I only had one shot and one ticket out of poverty um, and out of um, the village, um, and that ticket was doing well in um, um, the exams, because we have exams at eighth grade. Um, and um, basically, to be able to get into the boarding school I went to, um, the only way I could do that is if I would be ranked the first kid um, on the eighth grade exam in my county, so that I could represent the, the I could take the county's slot. Um, so it's kind of like the NBA draft, but um, now the talent is just how you're going to do on a three-day exam. Um, and um, um, as I approached eighth grade, um, and as I approached this exam, it became at a really young age a do-or-die moment, right? Because if I couldn't be able to go to this um, publicly funded government, uh, secondary school, um, my parents couldn't afford to um, take me to any other form of secondary school. Um, and if I can't go to secondary school, you know, the kind of dreams that I can dream, the kind of life I can live, you know, um, the kind of just different, you know, it's a different vibe, you know. Um, and um, I am, I do consider myself to have been lucky. Um, and I actually, and if you ask my parents, you know, people ask them, um, do you think like Tom going to Harvard is like the best thing that has ever happened to you, to, to him or to your guy? And they always say, you know, it's Tom getting into high school, right? Because um, that catalyzed <laughs> all of the other doors. Yeah, um, and um, it's just imagining the kind of pressure at such a really young formative age um, and the other options being... Yeah, and so th that's, you know, one of the things that kind of really inspires the work that I'm doing is, you know, whenever I go back home, you know, the kids in my age group who I grew up with, you know, who was such an integral, central part of my youthful experience, my coming of age, who were not, who didn't, who didn't, who, who were not as lucky. And just seeing the kind of lives that they now lead is, it is, it is not only sad, it is really sad, um, yeah, but it, it also just means that I can no longer be able to enjoy, like, my friendship and interactions with them, you know, as much as I will earlier. Uh, and yeah, and so it is. It was. It was. It was kind of really unfortunate. But when I went to the boarding school, um, um, I think the boarding school reinforced um, for me what I once again would call it fundamentals. Um, and so it was an all boys boarding school, and we will stay in the school for nine months. We had no access to electronics. Um, if you wanted to talk to your parents, you'd write them a letter or you'd have to organize with your class teacher to call them and they'd limit that like once every two or three weeks. Um, so we were cut off from the whole world. Um, and once again, um, to be able to, you know, thrive um, in this kind of setting, you had to really spend a lot of time being able to socially um, indulge with other kids and socially figure out your way around the school. Um, and I think one of the things I really learned in the school is, which is really helping now, is just an ability to be able to not be intimidated in social settings, uh, especially since I came to the US. I've um, realized a lot of my peers got a little, like, a little bit anxious um, in um, social um, environments where some spotlight or some, some spotlight may be on them. Um, and, and some kind of lucky to have had that experience, yeah. Um, but also, one thing just before we move on about the boarding school was 
it also changed, you know, as I told you when I was growing up, just being a priest or a teacher, right? But I moved from the village was completely off grid, a village where when the sun went down, our, our lives, you know, was closed for the night, you know, just told stories and went to bed at 8 or 9 p.m. I went to boarding school, you know, which had, you know, running water, access to the electricity, um, computers, internet, um, where like the alumni were you know, lawyers, like Supreme Court judges, entrepreneurs, doctors, businessmen, um, school had exchange programs with kids, some from like American colleges, so just like interacting with this new world, you know, um, exposed me to a new thinking that I didn't have, but also created a, a deep internal battle because every time when I leave the village, when I leave the school, I want to go back home, you know, it becomes hard to peacefully reconcile these two worlds, you know, and just, you know, just live peacefully in those two worlds, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, wow. Yeah. It, the way that you're telling the story is sinking in very deeply into me and and hopefully others as well. And for such a variety of reasons, one of them being that when you find yourself as the young boy, it was eighth grade taking the three-day exam, right? Yeah. When you're there and you know that that moment is, can, it, it will bifurcate the trajectory of your life. Yeah. And then the, all the other doors that opened up from going to the boarding school and continuing to work really hard and, and doing everything else in your life to get to here, um, versus on the other side of, like you described, that when you go back and engage with socially with the classmates that you were with up till then, that how do you engage then when what their stimuli that they've uh, been around versus the ones that you've been around? that the alumni of the boarding school are lawyers, entrepreneurs, doctors, businessmen, that that is a, so much different than being in a village where it's a priest and a teacher are the two you know, highlights in that. Yeah, the, the, the level of amount of, of, of dollars per day that you can earn in those two locations. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's different. Not only just economical, you know, but also just how you think and view life and how you, you know, figure out your position in life and what matters to you and your values, you know, it, it's, 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 uh, it's different, you know, my classmates um, almost half are now, you know, married and, you know, have kids, you know. Because, um, um, you know, when you can no longer, if you cannot succeed academically, then maybe succeeding socially, you know, by building a family um, is, you know, you know, an option. And you, you cannot blame them for making that decision. They're just trying to, in, in their thinking, you know, get the best out of their life. Or when you meet people and socially, you know, talking about things like politics, or how, who are you going to vote for, you know, um, and if someone will prioritize um, a politician who gives them for five dollars for their votes, you know, you, 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 you know, um, you cannot, uh, you, you cannot blame them, and um, that is why I think, um, most people get it wrong when most people I talk to, they're like, Tom, why is it that we have spent so much money in international development, you know, trying to create, to make people 
at the bottom of the pyramid in Africa changing their behaviors, but they're not, or X, Y, Z, but you realize that when the system fails, but in not just one person, but a majority of the community, you know, um, you cannot blame the individual for um, putting their own self-interest uh, in the moment. Um, you, you cannot blame them for prioritizing themselves right now and not everyone in the future. And it makes it now hard, you know, when you're trying to do things that are important, when you're trying to address issues around climate change and healthcare and um, financial sustainability that require, you know, um, more future thinking, you know, it becomes, it, it becomes like, it's kind of, it's a, 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 it's a vicious, it's a vicious cycle. It's a, it's a, it's a cycle, it's a trap, you know. Um, um, most people call it the poverty trap and, and, and um, I think it's a real trap and because the way you think, how you view life, not only the economic uh, opportunities available to you, it's a totally different ballgame, you know. Um, and then there are the challenges that people who are trying to help people get out of this trap also don't have a deep understanding of what it means to be in the trap. Well, and so they cannot be able to develop effective solutions. And if they were able to develop effective solutions, they can also be able to convince the people that they're developing the solutions for that these are effective solutions, right? Um, yeah, and um, um, it's, it's, it's something I'm grappling with, you know, like just the way socially engaging with my friends and my classmates, seeing where they are in life, um, talking about our goals and our visions and, you know, even our politics and our ideologies. Just totally, yeah, it's just really hard, yeah. Mm-hmm. Couple things. One of the things is getting access to internet, electricity, running water, shelter, other young people, this alumni network, going to this boarding school, this again opened up your ideas, your imagination to see different ways that you could contribute to the world, yeah. your creative potential versus just well, family mm-hmm. um, or whatever the other, the other options are. We could spend hours just on this yeah. yeah segment because i think it's also really important for like did you have what was the house like what was the area of living like for you and your mother and father and siblings what was the what was the sleeping like what was the everyday life like can you give us a taste yeah yeah um yeah so um i grew up on a sugarcane farm um so my family uh we have been traditionally sugarcane farmers um um and um um how my home is structured um so my grandfather had three wives um and so um, in the lua tradition so that's my, my tribe we have um, uh, lock, we have customs around how the setup becomes um, if someone uh, has more than one one way. Um and so my uh, dad being um, one of the youngest uh, um, kids, uh, the youngest male kids um, in this polygamous. Um, set up, um, it meant that he had to stay according to, because he was the last one, um, so he had to stay um, with his mom. So that is the, the custom, the last one son is supposed to take care of the, of the mom um, um, and inherits everything from the mom when the mom passes away. So where we grew up, um, grew up my grandmother's house, um, 
it's like three bedroom, um, three bedroom house, and my um, parents had also a house just about ten meters from my grandma's house, um, and yeah, and so just daily life. So, so, so it depends, um, um, you know. Um, early in my career, like I had to be a little bit more involved, like the manual labor of working in the farm. Uh, but as I was approaching eighth grade, um, um, I kind of now had to switch gears to focusing on academics. Your, uh, your mom and dad were both alive, and yeah, they're still and both hard, yeah. still. And then yeah. your grandpa and grandma from both of their. Um, so my my grandfather died um, in uh, two thousand. Um, uh, but my grandmother was um, alive. She died in 2015, unfortunately, but she was alive for uh, most of my childhood, yeah. Um, for maybe all of my childhood, yeah. And um, the other two, grandpa and grandma from the other? Um, there's only one. Um, so I had two grandmas, yeah. Um, yeah. And then, and then did you have siblings too? So I have three siblings. Three. three. Yeah, I have three siblings. Um, my, um, so it was kind of, it's really because, um, so apart from my um, immediate family, um, so my extended family, we all stayed like within the same uh, vicinity. So my uncle, for example, um, was only like 20, 30 meters from where we stayed. And he had, he had a car, he had 13 kids. Um, and um, so this was just from my like um, biological grandma. And then there were also the kids of my two other um, grandma's um, was living around, so it was a, it was a, it was, it was quite a, a, a big setup um, in the in the farm, um, and so we, um, yeah. So depending on what you do, so if you're, because my parents are farmers, so every morning they wake up um, five a.m. go to the farm. Um, they've been doing that their whole lives, um, um, apart from a few times where they moved to um, Awend, which is like the small town. Um, um, next by and my my dad had a bakery for a while, um, yeah. And it'd be it'd be f also having you and your siblings also learn about farming and the land. And, yeah. And and you would all you would then go through cycles of of farming on the land, harvesting the crop, selling the crop to those that are coming to buy the sugar cane, and you would follow a cycle. Yeah, yeah. And so, for example, if so, so if 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 like school didn't work out, then I'd be. Um, I'd be running the farm. I'd be like, um, that would be like my primary um, um, vocation right now. What are your three siblings? Doing? Yeah, so um, my family has been, you know, just given the life trajectories of most people in, in our village. We've been, you know, quite lucky. My um, elder brother um, joined the, the military for a while. Um, and um, um, it's a really interesting story, and I, I don't want to like, tell uh, his story on his behalf. Uh, but for him, you know, his ticket was joining the, the military, not because of an overt love, you know, for the country, but, you know, it, it was one of the only ways he could get out of the village. Um, and um, um, uh, my sister um, also followed a similar route, you know, um, she, um, didn't get as lucky as it was um, academically, um, and um, joined the the we have the prison service. Um, so she works in the Kenyan prison system. Um, um, yeah, and my younger brother is just graduating from high school, and I think he'll be at least going to the local universities in Kenya. Um, yeah, all of the siblings are left the village. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, yeah. So everyone moved on to life trajectories that were outside of farming yeah. in a rural area. <sighs> okay, so exposure to internet and the young minds in the boarding school, and how did you pick up your interest there? How did you even f get, oh, Harvard? How did, yeah, all that. Um. So actually, Harvard happened to me a little bit later in my uh, my, my my like trajectory. It wasn't something that I um, uh, had in my mind when I was in high school. Um, you know, the first thing that happened in high school was by so in the Kenyan education system, 
by sophomore year of high school, you kind of have to know your path. You know, so it's like lock and set. And so in my high school, we had uh, four careers. So you're either a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer, or you're a loser. So, <laughs> so they call it Dell, <laughs> doctor, engineer, <laughs> lawyer, or loser. Um, and so by the end of freshman year, the careers um, department. Where's artist? Um, you know, where's scientist? Uh, yeah, so. Uh, unfortunately, that wasn't in the business person. Yeah, yeah, uh, that wasn't in the that was in the that was in the, the not in the acronym. Yeah, that was in the, <laughs> that was in the ball game. Um, so I was in the law. I was I was assigned to be a lawyer because um, for two things I could talk um, for a long time, <laughs> 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 um, and I also did a little bit better in English than chemistry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chemistry is a hard subject, yeah. Yeah, so they decided, uh, so you are going to be um, a lawyer. And um, as a sophomore, I was like, why should, why should I be taken from the village, exposed to all this world, you know, especially at a time where young people um, in other parts of the world were doing crazy things. This was a time where... Um, like the tech entrepreneurs um, in the Silicon Valley had were revolutionizing the entire ball game and they were serving as inspiration all into kids in America, but all over the world, you know, um, it was a time where, you know, um, young artists, you know, like Justin Bieber were going viral and they were really young, still in school, you know, the people who we could relate with. Um, and here I was, shown this whole world and told that um, I had to be a lawyer just because uh, uh, I talk a lot and um, I did well in English composition. Um, and so I felt really frustrated by the system. And I think it was something where I realized that the system that I had found myself in wasn't going to work for me, you know. Um, and at that part of time, um, as I was figuring this out, it was the first time, uh, you know, it's a really common poem here in the US, but it was the first time I read Robert um, Frost's The Path Not Taken. Mm -hmm. And when I read it, it just crystallized what I had been thinking that um, if I was going to be happy and successful in whatever I was to do, um, I had to create my own path. Yeah. Um, uh, um, and I figured out the best way to create my own path was to think about what is important to me, yeah. what I care about, um, you know, things that I will happily commit a lot of time and resources to doing. Um, and the first thing that came to mind was just the living standards in my village, yeah. you know. Um, um, you know, I could be a lawyer and in fact I was like admitted to, because um, you got admitted to law school and you're still in high school in Kenya, to like Kenya's like best law school and I could have gone that path. But I realized that I was Like how I, and I might be wrong, but how I rationalize it was, you know, I have been one of very few lucky people in my community, you know, who has gotten the chance and the opportunity to be able to see a different world and explore different possibilities. Um, and I could either think about it selfishly and be like, um, I deserve this, I've worked hard, you let me you know, live a great financially viable life um, and join the echelons of you know, Kenyans, like establishment or something like that. Um, um, or I could find ways to give, you know, um, the community and the people that I cared about with also what I call an opportunity to 
to fight you know like it's not that it's it's you know it's not that we lack um an innovation or creativity you know, the saying is true that you know talent is universal but opportunities are not right um and um i think it's pretty sad that most dreams are shattered not because of a lack of talent not because of a lack of hard work but just a lack of opportunities yeah um and when i realized towards one of the breaks uh, the other uh, in in sophomore year yeah the my mom had developed this um, respiratory tract infection primarily as a result of just cooking for us and making food for us and not because of any like personal negligence on on our side not because of any like life choices that she had made to engage in activities that made her develop this infection it was a really sobering moment you know I ask myself why did I have to work really hard why did I have to leave my village and quote unquote get an education if I couldn't help my mom you know like why was I why was I you know why 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 do all this if you know, you you can't um you know have a profound impact in the lives of people who mean something to you um and so that was why our oh, junior um uh, started working on just various different projects um i didn't know where um any of them would lead uh, or which direction it will take um i didn't know if it was going to be successful or not um i didn't know if um i fail and go back to the village or wherever we'll come but you know i had this you know it's just this drive and my deep personal connection to the problems that i was thinking about i think spurred um that drive yeah you being able to recognize that you got blessed with being able to realize actualize your opportunities and then want to help those that don't have those opportunities is a critical moment of reflection in life because we can so often do what you said of saying that hey i got mine but to be able to say that we stand on the shoulders of giants that we have this unity that we need to have a harmony together and that one of the ways that i can give after i've been blessed is to help open up those doors of opportunity for other people and i love that a lot about you and there's also this moment of realization for you that why is it that the numbers are are staggering that 80% of Kenyan households use charcoal for cooking. So that your mom being diagnosed with this lung disease, this infection, that this happens 4.3 million die every year from indoor that. cooking smoke. Yeah. So these are preventable deaths. These are and your mind is is think how do we prevent this how do we upgrade the code from yeah. old cooking code to new code yeah and it's really even more um sobering if can use a word if the solutions or the preventions to these problems exist you know and that is one of the greatest challenges that i, st- I still cannot resolve you know we were we spent a lot of time with grincher figuring out the nitty gritties of trying to make a solution which is great but still not perfect work yet great clean solutions 
they like solutions. Yeah, like people, for example, in the U.S. don't die when they're cooking. Yes. Right. Um, High-income people don't die when they're cooking. Right. Um, the will for solving this problem has already been invented. Right. Uh, but now we have to reinvent and create a new will. <laughs> you know, just because of the way you know the structure and society is. And you know, just to piggyback on what you say, you know, it's sad. I think in our recent history as 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 humans, we've kind of forgotten that we you know we are here. You know, cut see, uh, we are here on the we are the box of giants. You know, and our society just to be able to survive and evolve to be in a position where we can now build this great technology we are building. You know, uh, we had people who had to figure out basic things like survival and they did not monetize or 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 or, or patent them you know fire they didn't monetize or patent it you know yeah. even the original wheel they didn't yes. create a a, a a a a man kill man economy out of it you know language um, and art yeah, yeah yeah and um now we are in the richest time that we've ever been in, in, in the world, but we are also in the most equal that we have ever been yeah. at the same time. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, it's clean cooking is a really huge issue, especially in the developing world, you know, 4.3 million deaths annually, um, mainly women, because in most societies, uh, women have to be the ones who bear the burden of uh, taking care of the family. Um, and this is from using either wood or charcoal. Yeah, wood-based fuels. Wood-based wood -based fuels. fuels. Yeah. In, indoors, In, too, so that it's not like there's circulation. So that is a main issue, because yeah, yeah. it is, you know, indoors, right? Um, you know, because um, there is some, I mean, you know, it's like, especially with things like cooking, there's like some element of privacy and, uh, you know, family, um, privacy that people want to um, have around, like where they cook and where they eat, um, and so the result of that, most cooking, like in most parts of the world, is primarily done indoors, and it is really, you know, unfortunate um, the way in this we are still here, and it's just unfortunate that there isn't a lot of like resources and time and commitment um, that is being put to towards solving this problem. Um, and so we, we, what we were doing is we uh, were making alternative cooking fuel from sugarcane waste. And this is your company, Green Chair. Yeah. yeah. And so there are three reasons that inspired that thinking. So, first of all, just the realities of the um, economic condition, right? Uh, it is easy for like an easy solution will be let us get everyone hooked to maybe the grid, let us get everyone g like clean gas cookers, right? Uh, but that is um, because of the economic system uh, outside the reach of, um, of those like a non-starter, right? And then the, the thing is now we have to innovate around, uh, we have to innovate around cost, but then the problem with, Innovating around cost is you have to make a lot of sacrifices on quality and utility, right? Because um, uh, if I was designing a iPhone that will cost nine hundred dollars, like I can put state of the art um, LCD screens on the display. But if um, um, I was designing an iPhone that will cost thirty dollars, you know, I'm limited in the amount of um, things that I can put. So I have to make a lot of compromises and sacrifice a lot of like quality and utility just for, for, for that sake. Um, and so that's why we're using sugarcane waste and um, also making sure that the fuel we develop was as close to existing charcoal. That was important because people already have stoves that they're using charcoals on. Uh, most farmers will be able to afford the investment of, of buying a new Mm -hmm. tool for cooking mm -hmm. so we kind of had to meet them where they are mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, and so we consider the fuel that we're developing as a quote unquote a bridge into the future. Yes. You know, we, we, we don't think um, that green fuel is how people in low income communities in the world should be cooking um, while people in other parts of the world are enjoying um, really high living standards. Um, uh, but we, we think that for now, uh, as we figure out how to more equally distribute resources, just giving people, just reducing the chance of women getting respiratory tract infections, potentially giving people who really needed economic savings, you know, um, limiting the environmental impact of deforestation for fuel. Um, it's 125,000 acres, acres of yeah. trees lost each year to make charcoal. Yeah, so Kenya, you know, we have a crisis because our forest cover is now, I think, under 3% of, um, of the entire country, and it used to be about 20, 30%, like 40, 50 years ago. Mm. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, so that's, that's, that was the, what we were working on. And it was a great experience. Of course, it was also really challenging because you know, one of the challenges we faced was uh, fuel was really cheap, which was about 30 cents per kilogram. And um, for 30 cents would be enough fuel for one or two days for most families. And then how do you scale up uh, a business where the customer, the value you get from the customer, from business perspective, only 30 cents. And the margin that you have there is under 3 cents. Right, um, it, and the alternative is almost free. Yeah, it's free or or, or almost free. Almost free, free, and then to get up to get some green char is thirty cents a kilogram. Yeah, and most families are living uh, on two dollars or less. Right, <laughs> so um, 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 so to put one sixth or one seventh, seventh of, of their, their income. income into cooking. Yeah. Fuel. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so we thought initially that we could make people see the value of the fuel from a health or an environmental perspective. And the feedback we got was people would be like, yes, you know, I love the environment. You know, I don't want to see trees cut. You know, um, I potentially don't want to get sick in the future. But you know, I have school fees, I have healthcare expenses, I have uh, living expenses, and I have two dollars, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, so you have to make, if you don't make an economic argument, um, you're gonna have a lot of trouble <laughs> convincing me to do that. And from another business perspective, you're also pointing out that you making a three cent profit so you make it for 27 you sell it for 30 <laughs> cents a three cent profit mm -hmm. to make yeah a dollar you have to sell 30 of these 33 of these to make a yeah. dollar um and then furthermore is trying to you know putting this in comparison to something like uh, like let's say a tesla like an automobile that costs forty thousand dollars for someone to purchase and maybe it only cost them twenty thousand dollars to manufacture yeah. so they make a twenty thousand well, dollar yeah m margin this is much so yeah so, just, so so to figure out what the best solution is to a problem like this given the parameters like you described earlier you can't just go and get yeah. gas line running to for natural mm -hmm. gas stove yeah so to be able to focus on going and enabling the opportunities and decreasing some of the health issues like that. And the, you, you, you actually ended up going forth and doing um, Innovate Kenya, the New York City Social Entrepreneurship Competition for seed funding to get this going. Yeah, yeah. Um, 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 I think... When I was saying there were two elements, and um, it's kind of unfortunate that these two elements could not be reconciled. And so the first element is articulating the vision, uh, you know, f of the organization, articulating the financial need, articulating a plan or a path towards profitability, 
And when you're doing that, you're not doing that with your end customer, right? The people who are writing the checks, as you've mentioned, uh, some of them are in New York. They've never cooked a single day um, with any sort of charcoal, let alone green charcoal. Um, I mean, the lives are really removed from the problem. But to solve the problem, you need the, you need the money, right? And so it's something I call talking the talk. Um, um, and so to be able to get into the door and just have a conversation, you have to talk the talk. Um, and often this talk is really different from what, you know, can work on the ground, right? And so when I was meeting investors, I'd present a plan and I'll be like, uh, okay, so we need $20,000 to be able to set up a production facility. And, you know, we think we can be able to get like $500,000 in revenue from this. And this is our financial model. This is our distribution plan. You know, just making sure you take all these boxes that people take you um, seriously and trust you with your money. Uh, but when you go back to the ground, you're like, damn, I have a three cent margin. How am I going to make $500,000 for the three-cent margin, right? <laughs> um, uh, um, Some things we just have to admit are not venture backable. This is not a venture capital thing. This is a philanthropy thing. Ideally, <laughs> ideally, it is a philanthropy thing, right? With uh, the, with what you described, though, it's a, a model for you know which equipment you need, you know who you need to hire, you know how to get um, to more people. Maybe you need to just drastically subsidize um, exactly. and get o- all the way to free as the alternative. Yeah, that um, way your thirty cents for a kilogram is nothing for the modern economies of the world yeah so to be able to subsidize that to save lives around the world as from a philanthropic perspective is we just need to be able to do that better but there's a big um disconnect yeah 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 yeah. and there's something else about social capital uh, entrepreneurship that yeah yeah get to too yeah 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 um and it's really unfortunate you know the 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 week though we can't be able to get supporting for this and especially for me, and uh, that will eventually be one of the reasons why I end up coming to Harvard is still when I come to New York and uh, I meet um, a retired hedge fund manager from Connecticut and ask him for money, he still sees a 19 year old kid with a weird accent from some random village in Africa that he has never heard of. Right. Um, even if I have an articulate plan, uh, I have no experience doing this. I haven't been able to pull it. I don't come from a region or an area that is renowned for its entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial um, initiatives. Um, there are no quote unquote success stories of people of my background who have been able to pull off um, these kind of dreams. Um, um, and so those two experiences, so that and just the reality of the market made me realize that I had great dreams, but I was also extremely naive. You know, I thought that all I needed was to have a good product, um, work hard and things will work out. But I realized and I'm happy to realize that I, at also a really young age that unfortunately in the world today it's still the idea that anyone from anywhere you know can work hard and um, access resources and be successful um, is great but it's a fantasy you know um, 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 uh, I realized that I had a glass ceiling. All the people who were giving me money were not giving me money because they believed in my idea or what I was trying to do. But sometimes, because of selfish reasons, where they were either felt sympathy towards me or um, 
they having in their portfolio that hey I am supporting this kid from Africa makes them look good um, in whatever social or whatever cycles that 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 they are they are in right um, and locally working on the ground realize that how like I couldn't blame people who were like we really like what you're doing but hey you know we don't gonna buy this for thirty cents we just can do it right so I was in a position where in terms of raising money and getting capital, I kind of had reached the ceiling. Um, in terms of working with local communities to get the buy-in, they just didn't have ways to, you know, buy-in behind like part in the bulk moral support kind of way. Um, Even though you couldn't get it from the villagers, the institutions, the schools, the factories, they could transition away, they could pay the 30 cents a kilogram. Yeah, they could, you know, uh, but also, couldn't cause. Primarily, I was still, you know, for example, this is one of the most uh, sobering experiences um, for me when I was at Grincha, is the we have um, I don't know if I think it's maybe a, it's a multinational called Bata. It's a shoe company, um, and they have like large shoe factories in Kenya. And for some reason, we use firewood um, within in the production facility. Um, and um, I had been corresponding with the head of sales and the CEO, just trying to see if we could um, be able to sign them up to buy our products. And they needed like quite a lot of. They needed about like three tons a week which if uh, it was a delay, if we could close, like, would have given us quite a, a good revenue boost. But when I went to meet the um, head of sales and the CEO to, for like the in-person negotiations, uh, two like people in their 40s and 50s, and they looked at me and they're like, yo, young man, you're 19 year old, you want us to give you and he wants to give you a two ton a week contract for a major part of our production system. Um, unfortunately, you know, while we think your proposal is strong, we just can't trust you because you're young. Yeah, you because know, you have no quote unquote real life credentials that can show that you're able to 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 you know, do this. Yeah, and so it was really, you know, it's kind of really... We need to change that paradigm. Young people need to be given those opportunities when they just need to come with you and see, oh, look, look at the production. They can make two tons a week. Okay, great. Yeah. We They can make it happen. Let's give them a shot. That type of a thing so that we can get more young people to have these opportunities like you're yeah. describing. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, we also will eventually need... Um, in other parts of the world, trailblazers. Um, we need one or two or three like um, young people who see do it, something. Be it. Yeah, and yeah. yeah, yeah. So that um, other young people can see that. Yeah, yeah. And also, all people can see them. Older people as, as can see. see, and so like yes. kind of like changes the narrative a little bit. Yes. Um, yeah. So um, in twenty fifteen. Um, Towards 2016, I kind of realized that, um, um, you know that I, I realized that it was going to take a really long time for Green Chair to grow to the organization I wanted to be. I realized that um, perhaps hired uh, pushed the needle as much as I could. Uh, you know, I committed three years to it since 2013. Um, grown it to 20 people. We had like 3,000 homes which were buying our products. Uh, raise some venture funding, um, but I just couldn't, I just couldn't figure out how to scale and make the organization profitable. Um, and and just so people know, there's other variables like the fact that for some reason Al Shabab is <laughs> somehow in control of the charcoal cartel, uh, and that that exists. That these variables in a different part of the world add complexity. 
Yeah, you know, it's sort of, you know, um, in, 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 I think one thing that uh, I've realized is much better here in the U.S. is um, um, I think there's opportunity for um, a fair competition of ideas um, 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 in the market. Yes, there's going to be like a lot of pushback from the establishment. Uh, but I think over time, like good products and good ideas win against market forces. Uh, but in other parts of the world, it's not that you know straightforward. Okay, hit us with the what 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 happened from Green Char to to Harvard. Hit us with that. Like from when I started it, or from towards Be- the end. Yes, because because you you we, you took us through the boarding school. You took us through Green Char, um, and then. You, we didn't. We didn't make. We didn't get to hit the real transition to Cambridge. Oh, okay. And, yeah, and what yeah, that was yeah. even like, you know, yeah. going through the process of yeah. the Common App and yeah, yeah, yeah and all yeah. that type of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's it's okay. actually it's it's it's, it's really um, um, interesting and kind of non traditional approach, right? So as I was telling you, like in twenty fifteen. Um, I kind of realized that uh, I was coming to uh, not like the end of my time on Green Chip, but the, the end of my, my time being like logistically and operationally and day to day, you know, in charge of, of, of Green Chip. You know, like when you are 19, 20, you know, and um, you have like 20 people who your average age is about 38 reporting to you. Um, you know, and that's like the livelihood, you know, like they have families and they have responsibilities. Um, and it's really exciting, but it's also really stressful, you know, because, you know, at the end of the month, every month you have to balance, you know, balance the book, make sure everyone gets paid, make sure all the bills get paid, um, make sure everyone is happy. Then after that, you have to deal with, you know, sponsors and investors and all that kind of stuff. Um, and um, I realized three things. I realized that one, I had not allowed myself an opportunity to um, experience personal growth and really realize and, and discover who I was. You know, um, I um, had to grow up really quickly. You know, I, I had to take a lot of responsibilities really quickly. I've uh, had to be independent in my life, like, really quickly. Um, and I'm really lucky, in hindsight, to have had those experiences. But I hadn't, like, taken time to just, just time to just think about Tom, for example. Um, so that was one thing. Uh, the second thing is I knew I needed a break. Um, I also didn't know what I like. I didn't know what I wanted to do immediately. I knew I was gonna still be involved in like fundraising and thought leadership and that kind of stuff, but that doesn't, you know, that doesn't take forty hours a week, you know. Um, and so I kind of needed to figure out what I was gonna do, but I didn't, you know, um, um, effectively know what it was that I was gonna do. I thought I met this guy called David Sanger, who I really resonated with and I really connected to. Um, so he was a kid from Sierra Leone who had grown up through the war in Sierra Leone. Um, it was a really impactful life story. Some of his family, like their lips were, limbs were chopped off during the war. Uh, and somehow he came to Harvard um, and went here for his undergrad. And then he went to MIT for his um, PhD, and I think he was developing pro- like artificial prosthetics um, for his PhD. Um, and he was also one of the, he had been involved as one of the co-founders of Innovate Kenya. It's just kind of hard to marry him. Um, and the moment I interacted with him, um, um, and I just saw how Um, I call it how David walked the room, if that is how I call it. Um, I, I traveled with him a few times um, and just saw how he will be able to go into 
like meetings in New York with like the Rockefeller Foundation and the Lemelson Foundation and you know they're writing like hundred thousand dollar checks, eight hundred thousand dollar checks, right? Um, and um, he will do this in a really effective way, and he was um, really effectively able to um, not only articulate what he wanted to do, but also gather the resources to achieve what he wanted to do um, in a way that um, I was 20 year old really inspired me and really yes. um, for the first time in my life I kind of um, had this quote unquote troll model or idol who I could model uh, my path around um, and um, 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 and uh, David we were also kind of well connected um, within the Harvard community um, and um, within the Stanford community also. Um, and so in around March, February 2016, I remember specifically, um, um, I got two offers to one to come to Harvard and another to come go to Stanford, um, which is kind of really interesting because um, I didn't go through like you know, the traditional, um, you know, application process, you know, um, for, 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 for um, you know, coming to, to college that my, most of my peers now in college have. Um, and so I kind of wanted to see what we will do. Um, and um, so I negotiated with both schools to see, you know, which school will um, give me the best um, offer. Um, and um, well, like both gave me really good offers, but I think Harvard kind of went out of its way to show that they really wanted me to come here. Um, and um, so that's how, I, that's how I ended up in, um, in Cambridge, yeah. So David, is a huge influence that you saw him in his a in his action and that you saw him as a role model in that sense and that you he also had come out and went to you said MIT and he came to Harvard for his undergrad Harvard and then went and to MIT, MIT. Yeah. and so it it turned into that see it be it as well that you we need more examples like that in order for us to be able to pursue our also our our dreams in that sense and then also that there's a when when you're going through this process of 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 getting this uh, this this it's an unconventional style of of application process and acceptance so what was um the unconventional aspect to it yeah, so you know, like traditionally, you know, you have to. Well, I mean, I may, I may not be an expert in this because I don't have like um, the good experience with it. But I think traditionally, you know, people have to do like a few um, of a test. You know, do like a more thorough you know, application um, um, thing. Uh, but in my case, what I just had to do was just to send in just to like, like just to mail in like my high school transcripts and uh, also got David, wrote them a letter. That's huge. Um, and um, he also had, I think one thing David had that I also really um, found admirable is he for some reason has his ability to get um, influential important people in the world to listen to him and you know to trust his opinion um, um i am really lucky that he saw something yeah. in me and you know kind of helped me um yeah kind of helped me um kind of nudge me towards actually because I, I i i at that time um was really as i mentioned i was really against the system and um Schools like Harvard and Stanford and similar schools were part of a system that I um, 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 I was against, um, and so I think out of my own free volition, I would have.
probably thought my, my time will be best served in different places. But I think what David told me is, you know, you have all these dreams, all these visions that you want to articulate. You know, you go to Harvard, you go to Stanford, you go to these schools. You can, you're much, you're much better and much more effective at being able to achieve, you know, uh, the, 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 the goals that you wanted to do. And when I came to Cambridge, you know, um, August 2016, it was two things happened. So that was the first time in like three years I had been in a space where no one knew me. So, you know, yeah. part of being an entrepreneur in Kenya, especially Kenya is a really small country, is after a while I kind of had like this um, kind of name recognition. Um, Saturated. And, yeah, and also more. being like one of the only like, young entrepreneurs who had like successfully raised money and was like building something. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, there was like some like attention and scrutiny that came. Um, um, and this was your second trip. New York was what year? As well? No, actually, that was my third trip. Third to, trip. Yeah. This la- okay. And um, you w- ten- took two trips to New York? Yeah, I took two trips to New York. Um, so I also took a trip to Seattle and San Francisco. And Seattle and San Francisco, uh, very good. Yeah. Um, and so curious as, uh, as you talk about, yes, coming in and nobody knowing you and kind of re- starting fresh in a sense, simultaneously seeing a country like developed an area that's developed like Cambridge versus a village and a and a capital like Nairobi as well. Just the differences in culture, the differences in people, the difference, all of that stuff as well combined together. Give us a yeah, a taste of that. Um, yeah, so you know, Cambridge is really different from Nairobi, which is really, you know, uh different from like the village you grew up in. You know? um, so for example, in my village, you knew everyone who you interact with ev- like on a daily basis. They knew you, they knew your parents, they knew your sisters, they knew your family, um, whatever tradition or history. Uh, people went to the same church, people went to the same school. Um, yeah, so it's kind of like a, like, I wouldn't really say life is static, but like life revolves around the same people. But then Nairobi is kind of the opposite spectrum. Six million people, really full of life, you know, a um, really chaotic city also, right? Um, and so um, I think staying in Nairobi for three years, at high school, I developed what I call a sixth sense, right? Um, you know, because um, we, we, in Nairobi, we say, uh, you 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 either thrive or you get eaten um, in the city, and so to thrive you have to develop this kind of a sixth sense um, 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 of just being able to. And it comes in like small ways and big ways. Small ways, just like being able to navigate traffic when no one really cares about traffic rules. Like you know, um, being able to deal with the cops when all of them want you to bribe them even if you haven't done um, um, anything wrong, right? Being like um, a young person who people think is a quote unquote successful entrepreneur, just being able to deal with um, the expectations that come with. Um, And so I normally, whenever I go back to Nairobi, I normally feel like alive, you know, just because of all these um, environmental Mm -hmm. stimuli. Um, that's something I normally don't have when I'm in Cambridge. Uh, I think Cambridge is, uh, like most American cities, a little bit organized, like less chaotic. You know, things run on time. You know, people follow their calendars, don't show up late for, you know, for, for, for meetings. Um, 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 and uh, just because I'm not used to that, you know, uh, I basically, like, I'm not excited by the day-to-day um, calendar of like daily activities of life. Whereas in Nairobi, like, um, I kind of wake up knowing that there's going to be something, at least something I didn't plan that's going to happen. And so I look forward to figuring out what is it that I didn't um, um, plan for that looks to happen. The thing is just the element of sociability that I uh, mentioned to you earlier. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. um, 
I don't know if it's a function of the city of Cambridge or just broad American society, uh, but everything is a means to some end. Um, conversations are a means to some end. Social interactions are a means to um, some end. Uh, we don't have the joy of interacting with humans just for them being humans, um, which is something that I found mostly in the village, but also in, uh, in Nairobi. Um, you know, just the ability to walk on the street, meet a stranger, and talk to them for four minutes, and none of you being considered a weirdo. <laughs> you know? um, um, it's something I miss, yeah. Uh, but I, I think I've, I've, I've grown a lot as a person um, in Cambridge. I think the nature of the city and the nature of the culture here, because people spend a lot of time personally and individually, um, you really get to explore yourself in more intimate ways than you would in a more socially vibrant, more socially dynamic uh, um, society where you don't have as much time to focus on the person or where life, uh, well, or, or where like even focusing on the person is problematic because you're trained that the person is part of the society, not uh, an individual entity. You crazy, we're talking about before we went on the show that the, when you move to a place like Cambridge, that the devices, these things that are, we use to access all of, not all the knowledge that civilization knows, that that these are so complicated in the supply chain and in the development and the user experience and all that type of stuff, that these are not ubiquitous in the village in Kenya. These are not ubiquitous around the world yet. There's only a couple billion of them around the world out of the 8 billion humans. And further is that, you know, the, another thing that's really important to understand is that you come to a place like Cambridge, you're automatically surrounding yourself with some of the most brilliant people that the most powerful nodes in terms of influence, power, intelligence across their fields um, as well. So there are these interesting differences between this. Um, okay, let's hit on the maximizing life outcomes of young people in sub-Saharan Africa. It's a project that you're currently working on called Shamiri Mental Health Project. Okay, so teach us about this. Great, yeah. So, um, um, just as, as you rightfully mentioned, you know, um, most of these tools, you know, that are so common and so like important in, in, in our lives, especially in the Western world, um, are unfortunately not as prevalent as, and as, as, as utilized in other parts of the world, right? Um, and so as a result, you know, some of the opportunities that people have access to here, you know, so for example, you have this vibrant show, you know, um, young people um, where I come from who may have similar um, ideas, similar visions, cannot be able to uh, um, realize and actualize them in a similar way. Um, and so I think the challenge, um, the biggest challenge in my generation, um, and by that I just mean like sub-Saharan African generation, is going to be that we have a really youthful population. I think the mean age is 18 years yeah. old in the continent. Um, it is projected that this uh, young population is going to double uh, by 2050. Um, but then the system has not been built to effectively provide this youthful population um, with opportunities that they need to succeed in the 21st century. And so we are um, kind of at a crossroads where we either have this vibrant, dynamic, energetic, youthful population that's about to explode and uh, unleash so much um, potential that can change the trajectory of so many people's lives and so many things in the world, right? Or we are standing just before a humanitarian crisis of tons and tons of young, youthful people who have given up because they don't have enough opportunities to, 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 to succeed. Um, and um, I personally think that there will be 
maybe the problem that I'll spend most of my uh, life thinking about and, 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 and trying to figure out. Uh, but it's also a really big and broad problem, right? And so to tackle yeah. it effectively, you yes. have to kind of like segment it into smaller, you know, segments that you can tackle one by one. And so right now, um, I'm really focusing on um, the academic and uh, mental health outcomes of young people, um, especially adolescents in schools. And why I think this is important because uh, most of life outcomes are determined during this really formative um, age. So it's kind of like your life is set at a really young age. Like what um, happened to you in eighth yeah, grade. Yeah. yeah. Um, and just because of this is also more pressure to, you know, because most things are, you, most of your decisions are at a time when you still don't have a f good grasp of the world, this make or break determines mm -hmm. your, your, your future. Um, and um, there's also just the hardships, um, life hardships uh, and similar things. Um, and so I think the toll on many um, young kids' uh, mental health is high just because of this um, increase, this really tremendous pressure at a really young age. Um, but still, there is limited or no work being done to kind of address this issue. Um, and so that's why I think mental health is really important for, for young um, for young adolescents. But then um, you, when you think when you're working with young adolescents, especially in Kenya and similar countries, because most of their future outcomes also are tied to their present academic outcomes, um, whatever solution you develop for any problem has to go hand in hand with improving academic outcomes. Because that is the most effective way that you'll get buy-in from schools, buy-in from parents, buy-in from um, um, when the kids themselves, right? If they can see tangible yeah. benefits in the in the in the academic performance, so we right now in the process of trialing a few um, positive psychology-based interventions uh, that um, we think can help kids um, realize just how much um, they can improve and change within, without depending on um, external forces. Um, and whereas um, they may be in, they may they, been, they may have been served difficult hands in life, but they still have the ability and the the, the, the potential to uh, take control of their futures. And hopefully, we hope to give them some tools so they can add to their toolkits to do that. Yeah. Which interventions? Um, so right now, Shamiri um, is one of the interventions we're developing. So it's a Swahili word for thrive, and so. Uh, the idea is they're really simple tools um, in, in in the Western tradition, they call them tools in psychology, but I just think the general life tools that um, we take advantage of, but you know, c can have profound impacts on our lives. So for example, um, gratitude, you know, um, yeah. and especially in an environment where on paper there appears to be little to be grateful for. Um, if you can teach and provide kids with tools that can uh, allow them to feel more grateful for their lives, um, if you can work with kids um, and their peers and their schools to um, develop um, values and value systems that are important to them and figure out a way um, you know, um, that they can live up to their values in their societies and within their schools and within their work, you know, you, give them an opportunity to be able to kind of uh, replenish or rebuild the um, um, energy and the resources they need to cope with difficult life um, circumstances. Um, but also more practical skills you know, like financial literacy, yeah. uh, you know, sociability skills, you know, like um, how do you effectively interact with people in social settings. And uh, what I'm excited about this is because there's a local solution that so can be done by uh, and delivered by local people within the communities don't require any um, extreme expertise to be able to effectively do. 
um, and if um, so, you're delivering the interventions through local community yeah. leaders that work with the youth. So we actually work with local um, teenagers, we work with high school graduates, and so we train high school graduates to go back to high schools oh, okay. and uh, okay. deliver this intervention. Great. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. We're I'm excited to follow up on that. Mm -hmm. All right. So, yeah. we'll 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 revisit some of these other questions uh, that we have about the geopolitical side of what's been happening in Africa in yeah. the last uh, in the last especially decade. Uh, we saw an initial scramble for Africa where it looks like we potentially will have another one um, and to be able to treat that like we're helping people versus uh, just trying to exploit uh, resources and gain capital and land. This is yeah. a very delicate balance. Yeah. 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 And it makes a lot of sense why we are seeing this uh, quote unquote second version of the scramble for Africa. You know, we um, as a continent have like the largest ar arable land at a time where populations are increasing and we have to figure out new ways to feed human population. The tech industry um, you know, specifically um, has been built on the back of Congo, which is one of the poorest countries um, 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 in the world. We have trillion dollar companies uh, built um, of titanium um, and silicon, which are mined um, in the Congo, um, where the average income is about one dollar a day, right? Um, and we have, as I said, a youthful, a vibrant population, which for a lot of people means um, accessible labor force. And so we've been seeing, for example, China um, is becoming increasingly uh, important in, in Africa um, because they're signing so many deals, they're doing so many infrastructure projects. Um, and, and the Chinese government is taking advantage specifically of what they um, understand is that the average person in, in the African country doesn't care as much about um, some of these triggers that they're, that they're dealing with um, and politicians um, and government leaders are able to get away with corruption, get away with um, subpar deals um, and while um, you know, a popular pushback is that unlike the West, where we have a lot of Western governments or Western um, companies which pretend to have a humanitarian cause and pretend to be doing something for, for the world, but have often ulterior motives. At least with China, you know upfront what you're what you're dealing with. But I think an important thing that we have to think about as a continent, and especially as young people in the continent, um, who very soon will be the most important demographic in terms of determining who the leadership is, yes. is uh, we need to put leaders who are able to and are going to fight to be able to negotiate um, from position, at least of equality, but potentially position of power but ideally a position of equality um, 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 in the worst case, right? Because it is not a bad thing to have deals with China and with the Netherlands and so with Brazil and Russia. It's yeah. not a bad deal. We are an increasingly global, global. continent, yeah. 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 Um, and there's more to earn by remaining so. Uh, but we have to make sure that the kind of agreements we get in um, are not exploitative. Yeah. That the multi thousands of years of culture that has developed on those lands is not just come in yeah. one generation or two generations and just exploited yeah. and yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. grab like yeah. a game of monopoly. Mm -hmm. um, all right, and uh, on the way out, we're kind of in a crazy era of leveraging. Uh, the technological tools, it's exponential technology is happening. What is a skill that you recommend young people, children to know as we move into this age? Uh, I think sociability. Um, I think more and more, most of the things we do now and require technical skills for will be um, done via technology and you know, generation, the tables may turn and the most important skill 
uh, maybe just your ability to effectively interact with other human beings. <laughs> um, 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 yeah, and um, yeah, because I think ten years ago maybe learning how to code will be the skill, but I think we have quite a lot of people who don't know how to do that, and technology is improving really rapidly to the um, extent where most of this activities will be digitized as I mentioned, yeah, so, yeah. What, an, what a crazy thing, a couple decades of using technology can obsolete social skills to the point where they become so much in demand. Yeah. What, a, <laughs> what an insane thing to consider. Yeah, it's a good one. And last two questions, are we in a simulation? Um, I don't think so, because if you are, I would have gotten quite a shitty end of the simulation. <laughs> um, uh, um, yeah, I will, I will want to have a one-on-one -on -one with the <laughs> grand architect of the simulation. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's not over, though. It's yeah. p potentially a fantastic <laughs> ending. Ending, yeah. yeah. <laughs> especially with that actualization, like we say, of the young people yeah. around yeah. the world. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And... Last question, what's the most beautiful thing in the world? Damn, that's a tough one. Uh, I'd say life, you know. Um, I think without life, we can't be able to enjoy any of the other beautiful things in the world. So it has to be the most beautiful. Just living and enjoying living, yeah. Okay, so much beautiful stuff unpacked in this episode. Tom Okumu, thank you so much for joining us on the show. No worries. Thanks for coming to Cambridge and uh, spending four hours with me just making this happen. I loved, really every, appreciate I loved it, yeah. every single minute of it. It was right. such an honor and a pleasure. We learned so much. I greatly appreciate everyone for tuning in. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Also, go and check out Tom Okumu's links below as well. Also, do share the content like this. Share conversations about actualizing Africa, all of these different things we talked about with your friends, your families, your coworkers, online, on social media. Get talking about this type of content. And support the organizations, the entrepreneurs, the artists around the world that you believe in. Support simulation. Our links are below. Let us keep doing cool things like coming out to Cambridge for interviews. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace. made me cry specifically the just getting behind the eyes of what it was like you know being in his shoes in his village and having the moment of the bifurcation and life trajectory and boom 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 a couple more open doors with hard work and what the fuck you're in Cambridge at fucking Harvard and and now the stimuli that he's taken in to be able to go back and you know both yeah create opportunities of course yeah. but also just the fact that his brain cannot communicate with the villagers brains anymore